Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. You know I always appreciate your giving me some time with your ears. This week, you're also going to love our conversation. With me is Simon Gidney. He is the founder of A Mind to Care, and also we've got a caregiver journal we're going to talk about. And normally, you know, I like to say I love to talk about talk to caregivers who have turned creative, but he's not actually a caregiver. So we're going to have to find out more about Simon. So welcome, Simon. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Really, really honored and privileged to be here talking to you today. So tell us a little bit about you and how A Mind to Care got started, and then we'll talk about the journal. Okay, I'll do that. Um, I am uh, an Englishman. I'm a lawyer by background, so I hope lots of your listeners haven't <laughs> haven't turned off hearing that. Um, I moved to the United States in 2004, and um, to cut a long story short, I had a business um, for 10 years here, which I sold in um, to, just before the, well, in 2019. Um, and I was looking around for something else to do. I, I mean, I'd all, I've always been busy. I'd always, you know, worked hard. Um, and I think my wife would have possibly murdered me if I just <laughs> said I was going to sit at home every day. Um, so I was looking for something else to do. And um, I met a very, very nice guy, a gentleman called Scott, who um, had given up his uh, senior executive position in the oil industry Um when his father was diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's disease and he quit his job, moved home to help his mother care for his father. His father lived for another 20 years. Oh my Lord. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, Scott saw at first hand, you know, the strain and stress it put on his mother and he um, developed a kind of game system, which was a board with different game boards you could slot in and out basically designed for lots of different games that somebody caring for somebody with a cognitive uh, issue could use to entertain or, or engage with them. Um, he spent a couple of years getting it ready. And then um, just as he was about to launch it, he was diagnosed with uh, bladder cancer and oh. he was, he was very seriously ill. He, re he made a recovery, um, but it took a lot out of him. And when I met him, he was just, saying really you know it's a show i just don't have the energy levels to, to take this forward so i was looking for something else to do and um we'll see in 20 years time whether it was a good decision or a bad one um i said well i, I this is really interesting for me so i i came to an arrangement with scott and i, I took the business idea on um and we redesigned the product we had it made out of wood it's a lovely looking product um but we ran into a couple of issues. It was too heavy for people to really, and uh, because it was made out of wood, it's expensive. We also launched it literally a week before the pandemic. <laughs> Which is, that was probably good timing then. <laughs> well, it, well, unfortunately, you know, if you you could not, you know, people running memory facilities, care facilities, everything closed down. So nobody, mm -hmm. you couldn't go and visit one. You know, even loved ones couldn't get in and so so it was a pretty terrible time so um you know we we sort of sat through the pandemic i came very close to to thinking well we'll just I've made a mistake here and closing it but um we relaunched it at the end of in kind of end of 20 beginning of 2022 we redesigned it and we relaunched it and um the more I've been involved in this space, um, the more I just get drawn into it. Um, I mean, I was a corporate attorney in the UK. I worked in corporate turnarounds and recoveries in the US for 15 years. So it was I flew all over the US. It, it was a very hard corporate dog-eat-dog -dog environment. And now I find myself in this wonderful space where genuinely I, I haven't met a person who's been remotely unpleasant. <laughs> it, <laughs> I'm dealing all the time with really lovely people, you know, um, 
And I have developed a real affinity for carers, you know, for people who are, who are, I mean, you have professional caregivers and then you have unpaid family caregivers and they all do a wonderful job. But I think, um, I think there's something like 60 million unpaid family caregivers in the United States. And so those are people who've not chosen that path. Those, those mm -hmm. are people who, who have stepped into that path because somebody they love, you know, is struggling. And uh, it's an incredible sacrifice. Um, you know, I meet a lot of caregivers now as, as I travel around and I, as I say, I, 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 I'm getting, I get more and more drawn to it and the sacrifice they make. So I, I, I've told this story before, Mara, but I will just briefly mention it. You know, having worked as a long time in the corporate world, um, you know, which is very much dog eat dog, unfortunately, I was at a senior fair a year ago and a lady came up to me to, and she was looking at the game system we had and she said, um, you know, I, I cared for my husband he had alzheimer's and he passed away last year and she said i really wish i'd have met you you know a year ago anyway she started to uh, cry and um i put my arm around her to comfort her and then <laughs> i started to cry as well <laughs> and and, and uh, the old hard bitten corporate voice in the back of my head was saying what on earth are you doing <laughs> so <laughs> So that's, uh, yeah, you know, I, that, that's how I kind of stumbled into it effectively. Um, so there's kind of a caregiver to Scott in by taking care of his business when his health took a bad turn. So almost a caregiver turned creator. Almost a caregiver turned creator, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so what we did originally, what the original business was, we, we, we redesigned it using the same kind of concept. So... Um, we now it's uh, it, it's basically a folding white dry arrays whiteboard, which is also magnetic, and it's it's four sided. You can use it flat. You can use it as a single side. You can use it flat, opened out. You can stand it up as an easel. Um, so it's a very versatile thing. You can write, draw things on it, wipe them off. We also developed a whole series of thin magnetic sheets, which are also dry arrays and also magnetic. So they, for example, we have one that has a weekly planner on it where you can fill in your notes for the week. We have another, others that are puzzles. Uh, then we develop one in, con in conjunction with the Stroke Survivors Association, which has, um, it's like a mood board. It mm -hmm. has It has images of which people who have, speech issues can point to if they're thirsty, if they need the bathroom, if they're cold, if they're hot. And these are all, these are also, you can write on them, wipe it off, and then they, they can be stuck to the board. So that was where we went originally with it when we relaunched the business. And and we still, that's still something we sell. Our, our website, mindtocare.com has all of that product on it. Um, but in, uh, I, I, I found us, Recently, we've been pivoting more towards trying to care for the caregiver themselves. I mean, everything we developed originally is for the caregiver to use to entertain the person they're caring for. Puzzles, drawings, games, that kind of thing. Um, what we've started to pivot towards now, in addition, um, is things that actually help the caregiver themselves. Um, because I saw a horrible statistic the other day that I think out of the 60 million unpaid family caregivers in the United States, I think in excess of 70%, 70% have reported issues with depression, anxiety. Um, and, you know, they often are so consumed with caring for the person that they're caring for that they, they don't have time to look after themselves. And yeah, you so think I'll get, I'll get to that meditation app or the whatever the book that i was going to read when i get done with all this other stuff yeah that never happened you know, you know most of us don't die with an empty empty inbox <laughs> no abs absolutely right i i read somewhere um somebody said you cannot pour 
from an empty bucket. Nope. And and I and that's incredibly profound. You know, if if you're gonna if you're gonna pour something out for somebody else, you you need to have some. You know, you it's 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 why on a plane they tell you that if the oxygen mask falls down, you know, you need to put yours on first before you help somebody else. That might seem a bit cold, but it's extremely logical because you can't help somebody else if if you're not in a state to offer help. You know, now if you pass out because you can't breathe, <laughs> you're yeah. not going to be much help. No, exactly. I, I don't. I wonder why it's so instinctive to just help somebody else first over ourselves. Do you think biologically we'd we'd have a survival mechanism that would kick in that would be like, no, no, I need to take care of myself. But somehow that doesn't seem to be the case. Well, I think it's that's a really, really interesting point you raise because um, that empathy that, can I say, most people have that, that prompts them to want to care for somebody they love isn't present in everybody. You know, I'm sure you've come across situations. You know, I've had conversations with a family member who is caring for a parent, and they feel that other siblings perhaps aren't doing as much as as they could or aren't aren't helping. So, I, whether we all have it within us, but some people have it more than others, I don't know. But uh, but it, it's a, it, it's it's a good point. I mean, some people do seem to be able to just look the other way and move on don't they <clears throat> true i've i've heard people say i don't want to remember mom this way and that's yeah. very common especially if there's multiple siblings like three or four there's always seems to be that one that just you know for lack of a better term just can't cope it's and you know it's easy to just you know belittle them and make disparaging have disparaging thoughts about them you know they're terrible or how could they be like this but I, I almost think that's a coping mechanism. I'm not sure it's a good one, um, but I, it's not unusual to have somebody in the family be like, I can't engage here because I don't want to remember this person that way, which I get. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. She died when I was, hang on a second, 54. And yeah, <laughs> no, 52, 53. And, you know, so... She'd had Alzheimer's like my entire adult life. Yeah. Now, obviously, it wasn't horrific in the beginning. It was, you know, she was functioned mostly fine. There was things that were annoying. But it's hard to go back and remember, like, my mom. I just remember yeah. the mom with Alzheimer's. So I understand why people feel that way. It's just, it's it takes a lot to understand that. So. Yeah, it does. I, I think also if there are siblings involved, it may be that, it's easier for one sibling to think, well, I don't need to do it because my brother or sister, they're going to go and do it. They've always been the person who stepped up, you know? Yeah. Um, you know what they say, if you need a job doing, give it to a busy person. Yeah, that's very true. Mm. So in addition to the, so you pivoted towards items that help caregivers care for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's where the idea came from um, the book that we Put together, and when I say we, I mean I, my daughter works with me uh, in this in the business. And um, thank you. Yeah, it. <laughs> I'm holding it up for the for the audio only people. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a cover. It's got a yes, that's right, a cover designed for radio. Um, yeah, it's it, it's a fifty. It's basically a fifty two week self help journal. So for every week. Um, of the year, it's got uh, some exercises, um, uh, to, a to-do list, um, uh, a section where you can kind of gauge your mood that week, um, things you could have improved on, things you did well. And then we'll put in um, caregiving tips. We'll talk about uh, mindfulness. We'll talk about a range of different... It's really designed, I think, to allow a caregiver to just... or to, Not to allow, that's not the right word to perhaps prompt a caregiver to say, I'm going to just take five minutes and read and, and redo some of these exercises. Um, that doesn't seem like a lot. Sorry, go on. <clears throat> well, it's laid out very, and this is not a bad, this is a good thing. So it's, it's laid out very simple, with big text. And, you know, it's when you first look at it, you might think, oh, it's a little juvenile, but because mm. it's simple, it makes it so much easier to get into. 
You're not yeah. looking at a bunch of words and it's not mentally overwhelming. That's what I no, like when I got yeah, it. Yeah, because I think what we're not trying to teach anybody anything in there. Um, what we, We're really trying to just provide prompts, you know, and exercises for people to try. I mean, it seems silly, but getting we've got a we've got a section called getting outside you know um and again all of these taken in isolation might seem minor might seem trivial but sometimes just to get outside and get some fresh air you know can, can have a really significant impact on your well-being um and then we suggest you know we suggest things you could do outside um so yeah it's i, I don't know about you but depending when you when I read a book, depending on what type of book it is, uh, I'll read it in a different mindset. So if 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 it's a technical book, I'll, I've got to set aside some time and I've got to I've got to read it super carefully and try and study everything. Um, if it's fiction, you know, I, I burn through a lot of crime fiction. I can read, you know, that I just go straight through that. Um, something like this is really, I think, just just to be there, as I said, to just just to a little bit of a just a bit of a prompt to say just take five minutes take five minutes step outside of the huge list of things you've got to do today and, and just take a bit of time for yourself um strangely it's it there, there is a link back to the games that we offer because i was talking to a lady once about the game the puzzle sheet that we've got um and she said this is great because sometimes um because what as you know, one of the challenges of somebody with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia is, depending on the state of progression of the condition, is that they they might just sleep all day, and if they sleep all day, then they like to be awake at night. So that's that's double. That's really bad for the caregiver because they've been awake all day, and now they're going to be awake all night because the person might be wandering around or or what have you. And she said something that just occupies his attention. And keeps him engaged for 30 minutes, 45 minutes is great, you know. And in that time, I can put a I can put a laundry load on, I can make a coffee, make a sandwich. Um, so uh, you know, just just creating that little bit of extra space where perhaps they can just briefly relax. <clears throat> and when and if you start with five minutes a day, then you can once you've nailed that, you're doing five minutes a day, every day, maybe for a month or two, then you can bump it up to 10. Yes. And eventually uh, uh, you you build in to your schedule time for yourself, which I think new parents do. My daughter's 32, so it's a little hard to think back that far. Mm. I don't know how she got to be 32, because um, I, I, I know what I said a minute ago, but I'm really not that old. <laughs> No, well, my uh, my son turns thirty six this year, so I, uh, I I know exactly where you're coming from. Um, it's it's the it's the cousins. I'm the oldest grandchild on both sides. So when the you know the cousins are having kids, and the and I've got on my dad's side of the family, both my cousins are in their forties, and it's like, how the hell did that happen? Yeah, <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. And it's like, oh, it's crazy. But building in that time for yourself is really important and i don't i don't understand i this is i hope this doesn't puzzle me until till the end of my days because as my listeners know my paternal grandmother lived to 103 with her mind 99 percent intact the last year was not so great she had been blind from glaucoma for like 40 years mostly so blind from glaucoma and 40 then years. Wow. yeah she got glaucoma when i was 12 and she died when i was 54 so yeah wow. that's 42 years so yeah in 2005 she fell and landed on her good eye which stretched the retina so from 2005 on she was mostly blind probably not the previous you know yeah, i don't yeah i don't remember <laughs> before 2005 too well and in the end she had really hard of hearing so you can't see too well you can't hear too well it's like being in solitary confinement in your own yeah. head no, yeah. thank you. It's not always the prettiest place in my brain. So, mm. but that's my goal to live to 103. But I, I, I regularly think like, why do we get so dug in on, you know, we have to do everything for the, our loved one, like my mom or your sp a spouse. Why, why, why do we get so 
dug in, that we neglect ourselves, we put our entire lives on hold as if we can just unpause them when this person's gone. Because we don't do that with kids. So this is my conundrum that I think about way too often. <laughs> No, it's, I think it's a very interesting question, actually, because uh, it, with kids, you there's a time scale involved, isn't there? Because the older they get, the more capable they are. And and um, but with something like Alzheimer's, it's it's you know it's not going to get any better, is it? That's the, that's no. that's the challenge. Um, no, it gets worse, unfortunately. And you, it's like you just it's almost like being in quicksand. You keep getting sucked in more and more and more, and the next thing you know, you know their whole entire life is your whole entire life which isn't a bad thing except that like you said 70 percent of caregivers have mental health issues there's another part of that statistic that's actually gotten worse when i started this show it was like 30 percent of caregivers died before the person they were caring for and right. you know now i'm not mathematically inclined but i assumed as more younger millennials entered caregiving which has happened i think they account for about 25 percent of those family caregivers i figured that statistic would get better it got worse now it's 50 percent, and i think it's something like 60 or 70 percent if you're over 65 so it's like this is a very bad statistic and we need to do that for fix that which you know this journal is a is a good start yeah i mean i, th I think um Certainly, as you said, you know, it's it is simple. It's designed to be simple. And it, it may well be that people start with it and then it, it, it encourages them to go out, you know, and 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 expand what we've put in here. Um we'd like to we'd like to go deeper next time. And I, and what we're what we're working on now is something uh, we're looking at putting together. I don't want to call it a newsletter because it's not really a newsletter. What we have in mind is something that would be available. I don't know, monthly or biweekly, um, but it's packed with a lot of really practical things to help caregivers, um, you know, going into things that we didn't have a lot of time to get into here. So actual nutritional uh, meal diet or meal plans, you know, very practical stuff, including also some puzzles and crosswords and things like that, a little bit of humour, just something that that would drop on a regular basis that you know might help them or might help in a number of different ways. Um, so that you know, this was just the start, and um, you know, as I say, hopefully, hopefully we can take that forward later this year and and you know be a bit deeper and wider than we were able to be in the book. <clears throat> that sounds like a good good expansion. So the the journal, have you? heard back from caregivers who have been using it and they've got wonderful glowing things to say um no <laughs> <laughs> but 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 that's not for any bad reason um we when we we launched it and then um we were at a senior fair about a month ago and we had it there and so it hasn't it hasn't got out into a lot of hands of caregivers yet um but the people who did review it, we had people from the Alzheimer's Association who read it and came back with some very, very positive feedback. Um, a large a billion dollar care company also, um, a couple of their people read it and we've had meetings with them since. We've actually participated as a direct result of that in um, some of their online training that they do in-house for their own carers. They have something like 2,000 caregivers who on their books. Um, and we're going to start, the book's going to be, they give a gift a, every month, so they're going to give a copy of the of the book to, pe to, you know, to people. So, no, we, have, we, haven't had, we haven't had caregivers who've bought the book and have then come back and said, this has changed my life. But, <laughs> but, but everybody so far who has seen it, um, very, you know, is very supportive of what we what we're trying to do. So, I can relate. I've been out there for a long time, and caregivers are busy. They don't have time yeah. to write reviews. This is a hint. <laughs> well, no, that's very true. Um, write a review. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, it's funny because I can see two sides of it. Because obviously, if you're selling a product on Amazon, um, you know, like we do with our other stuff, you know, reviews are gold. But then, as a customer. 
when I buy something, it's always a bit irritating when you get that email saying, could you write a review? Because you think, oh, you know, I'm busy now. I'll do that later. And then you don't. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, it's a tough one, that whole question of reviews. <clears throat> I have a product that every time I get get the product every month, in, they say, well, how was your latest order? And because the link in the email, I have, I, when I click the link, my like internet gate or fence blocks it from opening up. And if I shop at the craft store, it'll be like, what did you think of these things you bought? Like most of the time it's paper. So it's kind of silly. And I click the link to, you know, because I know the importance of the, and my internet protection says, nope, you cannot go that to that, that website. I'm like, I go to this website all the time. It's so frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, modern times with the internet, I suppose. I, well, I know, and also to to be fair, there is a lot of stuff out there that looks genuine that isn't. So you mm -hmm. do have to be you do have to be careful, don't you? Yeah, um, and yeah. It, it's getting harder. Oh, so. it is getting harder. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, uh, you get a link. Well, I'm sure you get them as well. You know, you get links saying, "Please click this link because your package is held up" or something, and you know. <laughs> You're about to click it when you realize, hang on, I'm expecting a package. So yeah. the, 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 there's a lot of bad stuff out there, which, which again, you know, it's difficult. Companies have to negotiate, have to navigate that because, you know, if you, if you're putting a link in an email communication, you know, are people going to want to click on it? Because we're kind of, we're being conditioned nowadays, you know, it's, it's probably safer not to click on it. So it's, it's a strange world that we live in. But uh, I, I do think the point you make about uh, caregivers being busy is a very good one because, mm -hmm. you know, they really are. Um, so, uh, and I, I don't see any way of alleviating that um, for them because. No, because we need a lot more options. And I've, I've said countless times on the show now until corporate America realizes that family caregivers are affecting their bottom line we're not going to have enough meaningful change to to make a difference unfortunately i think you're right i think if if the statistic that 70 percent of 60 million people are suffering from you know depression or, or anxiety or other mental health issues at some point you've got to hope the penny would drop and and and, and government would take steps but as you say that could be a long way away Unfortunately, um, I used to, I would, I used to visit my mom on Mondays, um, cause I still had my other business. I was a portrait photographer, so I couldn't, I couldn't jam everything into my schedule. At, and I was always, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is the week I'm going to go on Thursday as well. Never happened. And there were times Tuesday, I would feel like, you know, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh with yeah. the gray cloud just hovering over my head and it was like, I must've stayed too long or, you know, it was just, you know, it, even though she was in memory care, it still wasn't an easy journey. No, no, not at all. Um, I, I mean, I think going back to the early part, I read a, unfortunately just, a, you know, as we're live recording this, her surname has gone out of my mind, but um, <laughs> Ronald Reagan's daughter, Patty, uh, mm -hmm. it, her last name may come back to me in a minute. She wrote a very interesting book about how she coped with his Alzheimer's. Um, it's called Floating in the Deep End. And, um, you know, she writes really movingly about how difficult it was to see, you know, her father, who was who was a very, you know, a fine physical specimen, you know, he's president of the United States, to decline into Alzheimer's and how she you know, how her relationship with him changed. But she, after he died, she started a caregiver support group at uh, UCLA. And um, she says in her book that after about five or six years, um, there was a management change and uh, she was informed it was going to have to close because UCLA weren't prepared to uh, take it forward. And she finally got through to the man who had made the final decision and he actually said, apparently, that um, Alzheimer's is the uh, least profitable area of, uh, <laughs> you know, health services. So 
My eyeballs just rolled out of my head for the non uh, for the audio only people. <laughs> yeah, I mean that it, you know that's that's a mindset that that has to change, doesn't it? Really, I think. But how you go about doing that, I just don't know. I think there's a lot of excellent tools out there. There's just not one way. It's like every caregiver has to create recreate the wheel for themselves. They have to figure yeah. out how to handle it how to get support, you know, what do they, I mean, it's like my caregiving journey is not the same as somebody else's caregiving journey. And, you know, I obviously support family caregivers cause that's what I do. Um, but it's not easy and uh, it's, uh, there are places that are trying to make like a national database that people can access on, you know, on the internet, but it's such a giant undertaking. I mean, because, you know, this isn't exactly the largest, or this isn't the smallest country in the world. Um, yeah. I mean, no. our, our current state is bigger than the UK, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's a challenge. Our, our current state is bigger than Europe. Well, it certainly was before Europe got significantly expanded. So, yeah. Um, Paddy Davis. That's the uh, I, 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 I was struggling for the last name as well. Yeah, so that's an interesting book, Floating in the Deep End uh, by Patty Davis. Uh, I'll, have to, but I'll yeah, have to look at that one. But to, to your point, uh, I think you're right that there is, it's a vast country, um, there's a vast number of people affected, and there is a lot of this, there is a lot of information out there. But but you're right, it's kind of all, I'm making expansive arm movements <laughs> for the benefit of the uh, audio listeners. Um and it's knowing where to go. There's, you know, there, there are a lot of very great organisations that are there, such as the Alzheimer's Association. But there are there are a lot of other organisations, and they're all doing their own thing. And so, yeah, you're right. Um, it it would be there's a lot of different places to go, and people are probably going to a lot of different places. Um, but it'd be very difficult to centralise all of that, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's the challenge. Yeah, and you know, you've got. Places, you know, urban cities that have more access to things versus rural farmland. You yeah. know, I'm an hour away from Sacramento, the state capital, and it's kind of rural here, which is kind of blows my mind. I'm two hours from the San Francisco Bay Area where I spent 55 years of my life. And sometimes it just, the difference blows my mind. And yeah. It's not, I mean, it's still California, but it's very different. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. So you have all that to deal with as well. You know, access is not as yeah. easy for some areas as it is, you know, like people in Sacramento have better access to things than I do, and they're only yeah. an hour away. And you're yeah. in Palm Springs. So I don't know what, so you're probably in between an urban city like Los Angeles and and the, bur, you know, the rural area, which I'm not even sure what rural is out, outside of Palm Springs. Desert, basically. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what I was thinking, but I'm like, I don't know of any cities outside or you know towns outside. Well, you've got you got Riverside, which is probably 90 minutes away, um, and then four hours away Phoenix. Um, but um, yeah, no, I th the, the one thing the one thing I do think that we can do while we while we hold our breath and wait for government to ride over the hill um, <laughs> is that if we is if we know somebody who is a caregiver. Then I think we can perhaps, you know, I've said this before. Even if sometimes it's just a phone call, um, or we drop in, see how they're doing, or you know, take a take a Starbucks in, or say, hey, I'm going, I'm going to the grocery store. Is there anything I can get for you while I'm there? Or even perhaps drop in for an hour and and look after the person they're looking after to give them a break. I, I think that that kind of Human bonding or, or encouragement goes a long way, probably a lot further than we think. You know, I'm I'm a firm believer that even if it's just a phone call or an email saying, "Hey, I'm thinking about you. How are you doing?" I think that can have that can have a very helpful effect. <clears throat> I agree. Uh, during the pandemic, I had friends whose oldest son, daughter-in-law, and ten-month-old granddaughter all got COVID, wow. and so. Pretty much every day for a couple of weeks, I sent her a text message with a funny um, GIF or just a, hey, thinking about you, 
Yeah. And I had, and I the first one I sent was, you don't need to respond. Just want you to know we're here. I'm here. You know, here's something funny. Yeah. And she didn't always respond. Sometimes she did, but other times, you know, it just went. And I knew she was getting them, and it helped. Yeah. And I I agree. I think we get wrapped up in our own busyness. Yeah. And probably, and this might be some somewhat um, subconscious, the fear of getting sucked in. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know. I know a lot of people who are terrified about having their groceries delivered. I have that every week because so we have yeah. one grocery store. It's a mile away. It's very good. It's employee owned, which I love, but it doesn't have everything that I normally use. About 90% mm. of what I'm, so there's still that 10% I got to get someplace else. And the next major grocery store is like a 20 minute drive, which makes me nuts. And so you drive 20 minutes, you park, you go in, you shop, you load up the car, you drive another 20 minutes home, you unload. It's like an hour and a half. Yeah. So I just got in the habit of ordering. Um, and I've had to learn what happens when you get somebody else's food, which has happened twice. What happens when they substitute things? Because you can go in there and tell it you can substitute this for that or don't substitute. And then I've also learned what happens when you don't get everything that was on your list and they still charged you. But it's a really good system. And I don't know why more caregivers don't take advantage of it. 95 bucks a year. I get a delivery every week. I have not seen any um, restrictions. Yeah. So no, I, I always t suggest that to people, but, you know, I should, while well, my neighbors are able-bodied, two of them still, three of them still work, three out of the four. So I don't need to ask them if they need to pick anything up if I go to the close grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, if we just, just switching the mindset on like, oh, hey, maybe I should yeah. check in with them and then, you know, when there's an emergency, it's not such a gigantic disruption to our lives. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I had a, an amusing thing happen a few months ago, to your point about online. Um, my dad had been in hospital again, and he was back home, and I called to see how they were. And um, my, my mother said they try to order a pizza. Sorry, I, did, I should say they live in the, in England, right? Okay. So I'm in, I'm in California. They're in the center of England. Yeah, uh, and... Um, they said, but um, the local place where we used to get our pizzas from, they we can't order over the phone now. We have to do it all online, you know. And we, you know, we can't do that. So anyway, I, after we finished talking, we went online in California and ordered the pizza and had it delivered. So the pizza arrived at their house twenty minutes later. She she rang me up, literally a gog. You know, I can't believe you did this. The pizzas arrived. Um, but I then, after after they'd sort of, you know, enjoyed the pizza, I then tried to get them to let me do online grocery ordering for them because I the store close to them. I said, just, I'll, I said, I'll give you a call on a Monday morning. You tell me what you need. We'll order it and it'll arrive. But it was, it was one of the things you mentioned, the substitution issue that was just the deal breaker. You know, they, they couldn't. No, no, no. You know, we, we like this particular butter and we, we don't want something else to come. And, so... and then you this just is... tell it, don't substitute. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. So I think that's 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 patience must be one of the greatest virtues of a caregiver, because I find my patience exercised sometimes when I'm trying to help my parents. So, you know what it must be like if you're caring with somebody every day, it must be it must be very difficult. <clears throat> well, and you have an eight hour time difference. That doesn't help at all. No, it doesn't. But you kind of, you know, you get into a routine. So uh, usually, you know, it means I can first thing I can I can ring them. So uh, they'll always they'll, they'll be up and about because if I get up at seven, it's like three in the afternoon there. <clears throat> yeah, that works. So I have a question. I was in in uh, Scotland in 1981, you know, just a couple of years ago. Do they still not slice pizza in England the way they slice it here? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Don't forget, Scotland is different to England. They may have a different slicing technique in Scotland than they do in England. They didn't uh, slice it. I had to eat it with a knife and fork, which, you know, being an American, I was like, what the hell? <laughs> actually, you're right. I don't think they do slice it, actually. No. And this was, I mean, the guys behind the counter were speaking Italian, as far as I know. Um, I made the mistake of, of intelligently deciding that everybody in school took Spanish, so I was going to take French. 
Have you met very many people in California that speak French? No, that's a yeah. short answer. But Spanish? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Would yeah, have been Spanish. a much better choice. A hundred percent. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were speaking Italian. Um, so, yeah, I was I was quite surprised. I was like, what is with this knife and fork thing? <laughs> well, I think part of the reason I hesitated is that the pizza place that I mentioned a minute ago, I, I ordered from a, is a Domino's pizza. <laughs> so they they must slice it in the American way. So uh, if you if you were dealing with an actual Italian uh, pizzeria in Scotland, probably they uh, that might explain it. <clears throat> well, it's been a few years, so it was shortly after the 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 that decade's royal wedding. <laughs> oh, okay. My, my pen pal at the time was she was aghast that when she came she came and spent three weeks here, and then I spent three weeks there. And she thought, oh, this is great. I get to escape all this crazy royal wedding crap. But, of course, we were going as bonkers over it as, as you guys. <laughs> that, would have, that would have been Charles and Diana then, I guess, Correct. 81. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, it was, it, was, it was an interesting experience. But, yeah, when you were talking about the pizza, I was like, I wonder if they slice it these days. <laughs> well, so- Domino, Domino's Pizza and Stratford-on-Avon do. <laughs> but I, I, I can't vouch for the rest of the country. <clears throat> well, the real Italians probably... They probably cringe at Domino's, but, you know, if you like it, you like it. Yeah, 100%. And obviously they've been very successful, so what can you say? (laughs) Those chains always seem to do so well. I don't know why. Although pizza's gotten so expensive and we don't have, you know, again, 20 minutes to to the nearest um, pizza franchise that's not Domino's. And, you know, then you got to drive home 20 minutes. I hope the dog doesn't help herself while you're driving. Yeah. Um, and it's expensive. So we've gotten into um, some frozen pizzas that are pretty good mm-hmm. for the price. But this is wholly different than talking about caregiver. <laughs> it, it, it is. Although I suppose the, the tenuous link would be the convenience of ordering some food in, I guess. But uh, yeah, because that is another issue, isn't it, for caregivers? Eating properly. Mm-hmm. You know, I know a lot it... of them that, you know, they feel like, they don't worry about what they what their loved one eats because it's not going to make a big difference. And then there's other caregivers who get very into brain healthy eating, which is usually much more plant based. Yeah. Um. I don't know where I fall on that. I didn't have to worry about that with my mom. My dad did all the caregiving, and he was a horrible eater. He was a horrible cook. So when she moved into memory care, they had fantastic food. Yeah. The assisted living, and I was stunned. I don't know how they did this. I should probably learn. None of the food needed extra salt, but they didn't add salt when they cooked. So I don't know what they put in it, some sort of magical, you know. The food was really good. Right, yeah. And I don't remember anybody in the memory care refusing to eat or any of those eating issues. So I think the but I wonder about the, I wonder about the caregivers themselves, If uh, you know, a family caregiver, whether they eat, whether they try and eat at the same time as the person they're caring for or whether... They just they just cater to that person and then perhaps don't have time to 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 cook themselves something that's nutritional. I think it's both. When they get many of the our loved ones get to the stage where they have to be fed, it's a little yeah. hard to feed them them and then yourself. Although that's what I would do. I'm trying to remember when well, my daughter was that at the age where she could needed to be fed. I think I did both. Like bite for her, bite for me. Mm-hmm. Again, we're thinking going back like 31 years. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, we got to scrape the rust off that brain cell. Um, but some of them focus only on their loved one. And I'm, an, I'm always interested in the ones that are very conscious about what they feed their loved one, but they don't always eat as healthy themselves because they're using um, food as a coping tool, which. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's well, absolutely right. Yes. Which is understandable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, food's a good coping tool in my world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Until I realize, oh, I'm going to have to spend three hours on the Peloton to burn off this if I eat too much of that pizza that I got from the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. But it's... I guess I, I guess somebody who's coping, somebody who's caring full time for something, they just don't have the time to properly plan out a, a proper diet plan for the week, do they? They're, they're, you know, they're, they've got something else, so much else that they're trying to do. It's probably not a priority for a lot of people, but I I know caregivers who do meal prep and it makes yeah. life a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. So there there's a hint for everybody that's listening that might not think they have the time 
it's amazing how like when I get my groceries delivered, I always get an array of berries and I take the berries out of the packaging, chop them up and put them in the bowl. So they're ready for my breakfast the next morning. Cause I don't want to deal with that first thing in the morning. I'm not yeah. awake until I've eaten and had some tea. So it's hard to deal with things while you're trying to in, ingest the tea and um, it, the food. It's a very, very interesting point because I am not organized to that level. My daughter, however, is. So on a, she will get the gross, get her groceries on a Monday. She will prep and plan her food Monday through Friday. And then she takes the weekends off, but she preps it all and has it all organized. So on Monday, she knows what she's eating on Thursday. Um, it's, it's a level, that's a level of attention to detail I would love to aspire to, but I don't think I'll ever get there. <clears throat> I know what we're going to eat, but I don't decide what day. Yeah. Like we, we've had, I try to pick out three entrees for the week, get the, all the ingredients that I need, make sure those get delivered which is the other thing you got to pay attention to when you unload the groceries. Although they do, they do text me and says, Oh, we've had to substitute some things. Like I said, I've, I've learned how to use the substitution button, either this for that or don't, don't substitute at all. So I got to make sure that that's not like that. I got what I needed for the meals that I was planning. And then it'll in the morning, it'll be like, well, are you in the mood for X or Y? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not, quite as detailed as her but pretty close yeah yeah <laughs> well so is there any so you said scott recovered from his cancer mm -hmm. and, and uh, i haven't spoken to scott for a for a year or so now but yeah no as far as I was, he, he he's written um he's still uh he was writing books on caregiving he's in um south carolina yeah awesome well like i said this is a really i'm going to show the book again for the youtube watchers and maybe the video clips but caring for the caregiver like i said this is a really good um you know pretty easy to navigate book and i highly recommend it because the other thing a lot of caregivers like myself find after their loved one is gone they're kind of left with like all this knowledge and all this experience and they don't know where to channel it and lots of people write books which is great and it's much easier if you have a journal to refer back to. And there's a lot of mental health benefits on journaling. And this is coming yeah. from somebody who does not do either. Yeah. But I am working on my own book. But it's, yeah. it's fictionalized stories from my mom's time in memory care. Okay. Man, there were some characters there. <laughs> oh, I can absolutely imagine there were, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, was, um, it was interesting, especially... The listener, the regular listeners know my mom's name was Diane. She befriended Diane Stewart and they befriended Diane Rubinsky. So we had Diane, other Diane and other, other Diane. <laughs> That's not confusing enough when you've got a normal brain, when you got Alzheimer's. Oh my God. <laughs> no, very... <laughs> no, I can't imagine. Yeah. yeah, it was wild days, but um, the book is linked in the show notes as long. I'll see if I can trip over my own tongue here as well as a link to A Mind to Care, so you guys can check out everything that Simon's been doing. And we wish you and your parents well. You said your dad is 92? He's 92, yeah. Yeah, he'll be 93 in December. So, well, yeah. you have something to strive for. Yes, well, as, as, <laughs> as do you. <laughs> yeah. I, I work on it every day. At least yeah. I try, you yeah. know, because there's a lot of things I haven't done, so I better, you know. Better, be, yeah. better live long enough so I can get them all done. That sounds like a good plan. Well, thank you so Jennifer, much. Jennifer, thank you. You know, thank you very much. I'm very, very much, very appreciative of the opportunity to chat and any feedback that, you know, your viewers or listeners, um, uh, I'll be very happy to receive it. So uh, thank you. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.